I would say that as an indigenous youth, you hold so much generational knowledge, especially with like environmental science and environmental protection. We have thousands of years of traditional ecological knowledge that people with PhD degrees don't even have. Welcome to Indigenous Earth Community Podcast, where we talk to indigenous conservation heroes from all over the world, and we learn with them how they're honoring the traditions of protecting the planet, and we get actionable tips on how we connect to the earth while softening our ecological footprint. I'm your host, Frank Oscar Weaver. Have you ever been up late, just mindly scrolling Instagram in bed, going to the usual friend pictures, bad videos, and then... Today, we bring you a snapshot of the escalating world situation on climate change, a crisis that is shaping our present and will indubitably define our future. You see a picture of a raging forest fire, crazy hurricanes, and record-breaking heat waves. Do you ever find yourself disheartened by the whole situation? Is it still possible to take action? Perhaps you, a loved one, or a friend have experienced the effects of climate change already. In July, 80% of the global population endures the hottest July on record. But there is hope. Amid all the chaos, there's a young generation stepping up and they're blending the ancient wisdom of their roots with the energy that only youth can bring. In today's episode, we're gonna be talking about native youth empowerment. Recently, I had an incredible experience at the Unity Conference in Washington, one of the largest native youth gatherings in the country. I was there helping out to mentor the Earth Ambassadors. And I met a young man, an ugly Duncan, from the Kirota and Cherokee tribe. He's a legit force of nature. He's an earth ambassador, poet, water champion, and an advocate for native education. So Anagli is going to be sharing with us his education history to really encourage native students. He's going to talk about the pollution that his tribe was facing and retracing the trail of tears. And now how in the unique conference, he's raising awareness about the issue of water. But one thing to think about is that even though indigenous youth are leading changes within their community, we cannot expect them to do everything. That burden, it will be too unfair, especially since a lot of them are in the front lines of climate change. So we have to listen to their stories and we have to support them. And to start, let's listen to a poem that Anagli did with his family. Children, from smoky mountains and rivers, I call out to you from the lands our ancestors were forced. The land of two waters, where the rhythms of turtle shells root us to ourselves. The place where we still witness the cosmic dance of the stars, and where the pine tree stretches its arms, yearning to join them. Where the crane's wings dragged and shaped our mountains and valleys. Where commodity cheese takes precedence over the legacy of our ancestors' seeds a place where our youth inhale the toxins produced by the factories we're bound to work. Where there's just as much lead in our water than children without parents. We don't know how to grieve our losses. Our losses of family, our losses of language, our losses of land. Water is our sister and she sees the exploder. Every stream, every bird, every katua, Every jalig are hers to take care of, so we must take care of her. By doing this, we say, si oje doha, we are still here. Children of smoky mountains and rivers, our existence today echoes resilience, community, and beauty in our land. This same land keeps us grounded with the beat of the drums filled with our ancestors' voices, forever saying, that was a very powerful message. Thank you so much for sharing with us. What inspired you to create it? I think water has always been just 
the thing that I've been passionate about, I was just looking at ways that I could incorporate my community and our stories. Like a lot of our stories are put into it, like how the crane drags his wings into the mountains and to make the mountains and the valleys. Um, that's one of our creation stories. Just like seeing myself reflected in poetry hasn't really been a thing. So I was like, how can I bring my community into the space while also telling an effective message of the pollution that goes on within our communities? I'm actually going to send that to the Environmental Protection Agency in the coming weeks. I really like documentaries, so and I was like, maybe I should try to make one. So I wrote a piece of poetry, and it has a lot of creation stories as well as a lot of things that we face as people from my reservation. And I really wanted it to come from a, a like a Katua woman. And I was like, my sister has like the best voice to do it. So the voiceover is my sister talking. And then all of the um, little girls in the video are also my sisters. Women are like a very vital part to my culture and like Cherokee culture as well as Katua culture. And we're a matrilineal society. So I think it was really important to have women at the forefront of these issues. I know the pollution that you're facing in your community that really inspire you to do this message. Can you tell us more about where you're from and that pollution issue that your community is facing? I grew up on the Cherokee Reservation, more specifically Stillwell, Oklahoma, which is in Northeast Oklahoma. We have trees everywhere. Like we live in the Ozarks. It's like really green all the time. We have all four seasons, like it's not always too cold and it's not always really hot. It is hot right now, but <laughs> um, that's climate change. I'm just, yeah, but um, I would say, yeah, just a bunch of um, wooded areas. We have so many lakes. We have Tinkler Lake, uh, so many creeks, just a lot of waterways. Um, the capital of my tribe is actually called, so Talakwa is means two bodies of water. So water is a very important part to us as people. I know that there was a bunch of E. coli cases from um, the chicken company that was um, dumping a lot of the chicken feces into our water. And water is used as a sacred thing for our community. Uh, we have this ceremony called going to water, and it's used as a way of cleansing ourselves before going to a ceremony. And yeah, it's just like really disheartening to see like how our waters are getting contaminated and how that can easily affect the way we practice our ceremonies that we've been practicing for millennia. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. And is this what inspired you to build your platform around protecting the waterways? Yeah, my platform is about bringing awareness to the ongoing water contamination issue in Northeast Oklahoma. A lot of our reservations are being affected by pollutants of big organizations like Tyson uh, Chicken Company or like um, some other past things like the Tar Creek Superfund site. And really just bringing awareness to like how that affects us as Native people and how that can affect our mental health as well as, our, as, well as our physical health. Um, yes, so that's my platform. That's great. And I remember doing the Unity Conference in Washington. You did an amazing workshop that was uh, sold out. There was no space left. So there were so many Native youth there that wanted to listen to you talking about protecting the waters. And Unity was such an amazing experience. Uh, what was the, some of the highlights that you remember? Well, my experience at Unity was amazing. Um, it's been a while since I went to college, since I've been in an environment of that many uh, Indigenous youth. Um, just like seeing everybody and talking to everybody and hearing their stories just gave me a lot of the energy I needed to get me through meeting the other Earth Ambassadors. They were just so inspiring and really just made me want I do better with my community. And yeah, it was really cool. During the Unity Conference, one of the amazing experiences that we had was being with the youth at the Capitol Steps. That was literally so powerful. I remember um, talking to my dad about it and I was just like, this is just crazy. Just thinking of like how our grandparents would have never thought to go like to come here. Even like when I was younger, I would think like Washington, D.C., was a place that like was only in movies or like just a place that wasn't built for me. Um, but seeing like, there was this one thing that I heard while I was at Unity and it was when there isn't a seat for you at the table, you need to build your own table. And I think that's just what Unity did. And seeing how like we're all there and all of our voices are heard is just really 
eye-opening and just really motivating for me because I just want the next generation of youth to be able to stand on the steps and do the same thing we did, but maybe take up like so, like maybe take up like both sides of the Washington DC, you know, I think that would be great. Yeah. The unity conference was an amazing experience and I got even to meet your dad and listen to all the great things that both you and him and your whole family are doing to your community. And I believe that you started the Seven Ravens nonprofit. Can you share us about that? So Seven Ravens is a nonprofit that me and my father built when I was a junior in high school. And it was just like our way of trying to give back to our community. We started seeing a lot of like the injustices that were going on with our community. And one day me and my dad, we were just talking to each other. We were like, what can we do? We basically came to the conclusion that like, we can do a lot. <laughs> like we can, we can just do our part, even if that is just a small part. Um, so we started out, my dad works for the Indian child welfare of our tribe. Um, so we started out talking about ICWA and um, how that can affect um, our community and like trying to keep ICWA intact. Um, we believe that is um, what has happened with the new um, release of the Supreme Court's decision. But um, then we started getting into other things like historical trauma healing and like the importance of that. I started learning about that whenever I did the Trail of Tears bike ride where I retraced the Trail of Tears and just learned about a lot of the atrocities that my community faced. We just like started looking at like different ways that we could do things. And just recently with my work with Earth Ambassadors, I decided that I really wanted to push for environmental protection with our community and a food sovereignty. So like those are the main things that I'm doing right now with our nonprofit. But we have a lot of different outlets to do, including like education equity with indigenous youth. And yeah, so that's Seven Ravens. And you mentioned yeah. that you kind of retrace the, the, the Trail of Tears. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, it was like the summer of my junior year. I went with my tribe and we retraced the Trail of Tears. And it was a thousand miles long. We just retraced the Trail of Tears. And while we were on it, um, we stopped in communities and talked about the importance of not sugarcoating um, our history and having our history be told by our people. And I think that's really important because a lot of times, especially with um, education in the United States, it's been used as a way of erasing us as Indigenous people. I think it's beautiful that our tribe was able to do that and send us on that. Yes, it's a, a very uh, powerful experience. And I believe previous Earth Ambassador and also podcast guest Kai participated in that. And I remember her telling me how powerful that was. Yes, I love Sky. I love her. A shout out to Sky. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, education is, is a big part of your life. I know that you're doing all these amazing things in higher education. And we almost miss each other in New York. I was up there traveling, capturing bird sounds, and you were there for school. Um, mm -hmm. What is, you know, your, your thoughts about, you know, being a Native American uh, student uh, nowadays? A little bit about my education journey was, so I went to um, a school on my reservation uh, growing, like all the way growing up until middle school. And at that school, I was really introduced to like my culture and my language within my curriculum. And that was really, it really gave me the uh, tools I needed to really see what my capabilities are um, as an indigenous youth. But then uh, when middle school started, I went to a school that was very westernized and um, they really didn't incorporate my culture or I didn't see myself reflected a lot in a lot of the um, places, but that was uh, proving to be very detrimental to me as a person, very detrimental to my self-confidence. Um, I would hear a lot of things about my appearance. I used to have really long hair at the time and people would say things about um, how I look dirty um, or like how I look like a girl. Um, I would hear things about um, like my language and how it sounded like um, gross words in English and like people would be like oh that sounds weird and stuff so that like made me really self-conscious about being indigenous within um schooling um but then I went to uh, Sequoia High School which is an indigenous charter school and that also just reassured me that my capabilities as an indigenous youth within education um is like I can be anything I can be an astronaut I can be a scientist I can be a writer um, 
So then that is why I decided that I wanted to continue education and that's why I wanted to go to college. So I just finished my first year at Brown University. Um, and it's hard, like it's really hard. Um, yeah, I really didn't see myself reflected at Brown. I think we make up 1% of the population at Brown. And I think the last statistic that was given was 75% of us graduate. Um, and that's so staggering in comparison to the other ethnic groups within Brown University where who's were graduating at like 93% or 98%. Um, so just like looking at the environments that um, were put in, Western education has been used as like a war tactic for indigenous youth for literally since the beginning of this, um, this country. And I think it still shows in today, but it doesn't like negate the fact that we need to be there we can add so much to these spaces and we do just by existing there. Um, yeah. And now I'm currently, I just finished my internship at Harvard university and that was really hard as well. Like I hear, I heard things such as like, um, you're not really a scientist or, or like things like um, indigenous science isn't science, but um, it's just because it's different than what everyone else is used to. Um, Western academia is used to looking at things um, individually, trying to be a fly on the wall of every experiment. But um, indigenous um, science and indigenous um, methodologies, we look at things holistically and we look at things as um, how can we contribute to them and um, how can they help us? This is that form of reciprocity that you don't really see within Western academia. Um, but yeah, now I'm um, going to Stanford. I decided to transfer from Brown just because I wasn't really getting what I needed from that space. Um, but yeah, I'm deciding to transfer to Brown. I mean, uh, I'm deciding to transfer to Stanford and I'm hoping to study environmental biology and Native American studies. And my main goal is to like just bring our perspectives as indigenous youth and people from the reservations and all these communities um, into spaces where we've been purposefully excluded for literally like so long <laughs> and um, yeah so that's my education journey and that's just my views on a lot of things with education. I really appreciate uh, sharing that with us and what would you say for Native youth that are thinking about going to higher education and they might be a little bit worried and and maybe even facing the same challenges that you have faced, what what words of encouragement would you give to them? I would say that as an indigenous youth, you hold so much generational knowledge that even the smartest people don't even know, especially with like environmental science and environmental protection. We have thousands of years of traditional ecological knowledge um, that people with PhD degrees don't even have. And you can teach people and there's this whole hierarchy of Western education where it's like the amount of time that you spent in school dictates um, how smart you are, but that's just not how we are. Like um, intergenerational teaching is such a huge thing back at home. Um, and the importance of that isn't really tapped on within education, Western education. Um, but just like looking at like how Western education isn't built for us as native youth, but incorporating us into these spaces is vital to helping all of humanity. Um, so don't really, I would say, don't lose who you are um, because you're beautiful. As indigenous people, you're beautiful. We're beautiful and we have so much to bring to these places. Those are amazing words. And I thank you so much for your time. Uh, for reflecting here with us, for sharing with us. I really appreciate you. I am uh, very inspired by all that you do, all different areas that you um, work on, you know, as an uh, indigenous student, you know, encouraging the youth, but also working back home with your environment, with the protection and water, and then your family's nonprofit. I mean, you're uh, in many different places, uh, helping out the uh, the planet. And for people that are listening at home, you know, they might be wondering, you know, how can they be inspired by indigenous knowledge to leave the world a better place? If you can give them one tip, one thing they can do 
to make the world a better place? What would you say? I would say building community is the first step into um, living a life of like sustainability, knowing where you're from, uh, not even just the people you're from, but the communities you're from, as well as like the land you're from, um, looking at things as living and not just objects. Um, that's a way of looking at it. Um, and getting in touch with like the local tribes and stuff and seeing how you can uplift their voice within um, governmental um oh what's that word <laughs> how can you uplift indigenous voices within the government um or like just within everything because like everything's so holistic like we can bring so much to so many different places but living sustainably i would just building community with your land and your people and how you can contribute to them. i loved my workshop like i was so nervous for my workshop but I think that um, whenever I got started and I actually um, just started talking to everybody and I loved that so many people were so okay with um, being part of the workshop, like everyone was contributing and like I passed the microphone around and everything and just like hearing from everybody and seeing how like, even though we come from so many different places, we do experience very similar things. Um, and like, yeah, it's just so beautiful just to have all those strong indigenous youth there. As we close this episode, I really hope that you inspire by Native youth and seeing how they are taking on protecting their planet. And, and yes, that we can still protect our planet. It's never too late. Ways that we can support Native youth. I feel like a lot of times we're looked at as victims or like people who need of saving, but realizing like, just because our communities have faced a lot of generational trauma, it doesn't mean that our communities are subject to that trauma. Like, yeah, we face a lot of things today, but I feel like looking at like, looking at all the generational trauma, but then also acknowledging that we have so much generational strength within our communities and we have so many answers that the world has questions to is the first way of supporting us. There you go, folks. Thank you so much for listening for another episode of Indigenous Earth. I really hope that you are able to support Indigenous youth. I'm going to put the link for Unity. I believe it's one of the best organizations that really make an impact in the life of youth. So please check it out. Also check out Anagli's Instagram. Give him a follow, give him a like, give him a words of encouragement. Check out Seven Ravens, do the same. Together we can make a difference. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And I appreciate you. And I look forward to being with you again. Agujeh.